Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bowen. The women of the Women's Auxiliary Air Force have been ever-present in our media since the Second World War. Whether it's Susanna York in the Battle of Britain film, or the ever-present wafts with the headsets on, pushing the counters for the German raids coming in. The WAF in public memory has a very specific role, that one within the RAF filter room. But who were the women that joined the Women's Auxiliary Air Force? And what did they actually get up to? Was it just working the radar and, and pushing German raids around the plotting board? In her new book, The Women Behind the Few, war historian Dr. Sarah Louise Miller looks at the Women's Auxiliary Air Force throughout its life in the Second World War, and the women who not only were working in RAF sector rooms and at radar stations, but in the Y service and in photo reconnaissance, amongst other places. The book is absolutely fantastic as it delves into the women, their personalities, and the struggles that they had to face during their service in the Second World War. But I'd love to know how she started and what was the starting point that sent her looking at the WAFs. Well, it's actually quite a funny story. It was totally unintentional. My husband bet me when I was an undergraduate 20 pounds that I couldn't get Captain America into my thesis, my uh, third year thesis. And I, I am a sucker for a bet, so I took it. And I was originally going to do it on the Boston Tea Party, uh, which there's no way you can get Captain America into that. So I thought, okay, I'm going to have a look what else I could do. Ended up at the Imperial War Museum at, uh, they had an exhibition called Secret War. And they had some items pertaining to the Special Operations Executive. So I, I looked it up and did a bit of digging and it turned out. The Captain America's girlfriend, Peggy Carter, was an SOE agent. So not only did I get Captain America into my dissertation, I got a picture of his girlfriend um, by talking about kind of representations of women in intelligence and espionage in uh, popular culture. So I won the bet. I won £20. But I also got an entire career out of it because I then got really intrigued by the SOE. So mainly by... They had like a, they had a dress and a satchel with a blood stain on it in in this exhibition. Mm -hmm. So I read up on them. And it turned out they had belonged to Yvonne Cormo, who is in the book. Um, she was an SOE agent, but she was also a WAF. Mm -hmm. the, the blood stain was from she'd been shot in the leg while trying to escape a German roadblock when she was deployed as an agent in occupied France. And I just thought, wow, this this is really really interesting. So I started reading. Did my dissertation, won my 20 quid, um, got a, a, a first and thought, I don't need to carry on with this. So I found out that she was just one of a handful of WAF um, who'd served in the SOE. So I thought, okay, well, what else did the WAF do then? Did an MPhil, which was on the WAF, and that is now in your hands as a book, <laughs> that piece of work. <laughs> And it is an absolutely fascinating tale. And we're sort of going to pick out a few few bits of it. And I guess that the thing that always strikes me with the story of British women at war is that they were so involved come the end of the First World War and then cast aside, basically, and, and until the second. So there were women in uniform in the interwar period what were they doing? Were they doing the same sort of roles that they were doing before, or were they being shunted into slightly less glamorous things? Well, so we did have, like you said, we did have women in uniform in First World War. We had the WAC, the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps. It's about 50,000 of them in the army by the end of the war. Um, the Women's Royal Air Force actually was founded the same time as the Royal Air Force. A lot of people don't know that. Um, and they had about 15,500 women by 1918, or the end of 1918. And then the Wrens, the Women's Royal Naval Service, about 5,500. So 
there's a good number of women in in military uniform, but unfortunately, the the service as a rule uh, disbanded. Sometimes slowly, we retain a number of them to help wind down the war. But it was an uncomfortable thing to see. The British authorities had only ever begrudgingly agreed to put women in uniform, and they didn't want to keep them that way. So it was, it was very much a back to the kitchen type situation and a lot of them have spoken in their in their sort of memoirs and diaries about how sad that was for them because they'd achieved independence outside of the home and then they have to give that up for men to take their roles in the in the peacetime military back and the women are sort of back to normal as it were and that's a shame because they very much set a precedent and it, and it was not easily forgotten so you know that their contribution in World War One is is resonating throughout the interwar period. It doesn't fade away. People remember seeing them in those uniforms. Uh, so when you get to the point where World War Two seems inevitable, that memory is still there. So that that view of them was was lingering, but at the same time, not overly palatable with the the sort of culture that was in britain during that time because come munich things things change a lot as everything is ramping up towards rearmament yeah it's uh they're always seen as, as kind of subversive you've got um, these kind of socially acceptable roles separate spheres ideology which is always victorian really this idea that women mm -hmm. nurture and that's why it's usually completely acceptable to see women in nursing roles, even if it's at the front line. We don't want to see women at the front line in the First World War and even in the second, because that's not where they belong. We don't want to put women in danger. But if they're nurses, that's OK, because they're inside of their socially acceptable role as nurturers, as caregivers. Um, so when you put them in a military uniform and make them do something that is not supposed to be done by a woman, that is subversive. And that's uncomfortable. And it's not just uncomfortable for the British authorities and the military. Some women are resistant to it. Um, and especially when you get into the Second World War, when you start to see women in uniform, mothers become angry because they'll look at a woman in uniform and go, well, if you've got that uniform on, you've taken a role on the home front. And that means my son is being sent overseas to die, potentially. So you get kind of pushback, even from women. It's not seen as this kind of feminist advance. It's very much out of necessity, um, and it, it's quite begrudging in some ways by society and by the authorities. So let's get into some specifics. So what was the Women's Auxiliary Air Force? Now, I'm going to draw into my usual bag of tricks and say my first experience of the WAFs were Susanna York in the Battle of Britain movie, and that's kind of, <laughs> kind, kind of where it started. But what was the Women's Auxiliary Air Force when it was formed, and what was that sort of original plan for it was it just really to backfill or was it broader it was uh it was meant to substitute so the clues in the name auxiliary i look i looked up the word auxiliary because i think it's a really interesting view into why the service existed and what was expected of it so if you look up auxiliary you get words like supplementary substitute it's mm -hmm. the idea was um they are meant to substitute for men who are needed in combat roles, women are restricted to non-combat, so we can send the men off for combat service and the women will substitute. That's the word that you see over and over in the National Archives files and they even have rates of substitution and sometimes they'll substitute two or three women for one man um, because, you know, it's, it's going to take two people to do a man's job with less training and less experience. So they're very much seen as a kind of supplement to the RAF rather than in, at that point, rather than integrally, you know, involved. That's surprising because, again, we, as we said at the beginning, they women did a sterling service beforehand and some of that lingered. But when it restarts again, that's kind of forgotten and they're just a third of a man, which seems remarkable. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of difficult to take actually when when you're researching it and you see these posters and you and and some of the recruitment posters are indicative of that that attitude come and relieve a man to fight type thing that's your only value to the RAF to relieve a man to mm -hmm. fight 
um, it didn't stop them from wanting to. They were so proud, most of those early recruits, and there were thousands who, who immediately, some of them 17 and a half years old, they're at the very minimum age and they need their parents' permission to join up. They felt so strongly that they, they went off to do it. And they know they're relieving what is essentially a manpower vacuum, manpower situation. They're okay with it at that point. Um, but it's, I love that quote. I think it's Eleanor Roosevelt where she said, um, women are like tea bags. You don't know how strong they are until you put them in hot water. And I think the WAF at that point were, were not unexpected of being put in very hot water, but couldn't possibly have guessed what was ahead of them. Um, and I think, you know, this manpower situation was just the tip of the iceberg and they, they as we'll see, and, and hopefully as comes across in the book, they did go on to prove that they were incredibly strong. Goodness knows what kind of tea that would have made. <laughs> so before we start looking into to three of the areas that um, you look at in the book, one of the questions I had now, I wrote this in my notes and I may have got it wrong. Did you say that they were paid 20% of what a normal RAF rating would have been paid? Or was that 20% less like the ATA were? It varies. So when I first okay. started this research, obviously, when you start any kind of research on the military in the Second World War, you're going to go to the National Archives at Kew. I had an inkling from my my undergraduate dissertation that I might not find everything I needed there. Um, and I... <laughs> What I, what I found was interesting. So there's lots and lots of files on arguments over pay. They're pretty, they're consistently paid less than men. And that's not unusual. Everything about their service was different to their parent service, the RAF. So their ranking system, their promotional structures, recognition and awards, everything was, was pretty much different. And the, and the pay is too, it's frustrating. And in some ways, you know, nothing's really changed. In, in some parts of today's world, let's not go there. But yeah, it's pretty much consistently a lot less than the men are paid. Some other files on that point, my favorite files about the WAF in the National Archives are big, thick files over the arguments over whether or not they should be allowed to wear trousers when working as uh, aircraft mechanics because they keep tearing their skirts, climbing in and out of aircraft which i think is a hilarious thing to have a big fat argument of a file over but nonetheless that that, that that does that does seem a very raf argument though yes it, you see some of these files that you think oh this is going to be great but then you realize it's definition of why a certain role is going to be posted to the north of england and only for the north of england and not exactly why you wanted it so an argument over trousers seems within keeping really doesn't it <laughs> yeah and that, and that's why we've had to draw so heavily on personal testimony imperial war museum records you know look elsewhere because it's so the raf files are so concerned with these issues that don't allow you to get into talking about what did they do though what did, what was their intelligence work what did it consist of and what impact did it have so <laughs> in some ways those files are revealing they, they tell us about the pay issues and that's something that a lot of social historians have looked at with the women's um, services which is why I chose not to go too far into it because it has been done very well by other people um, and we have to remember those those things where the WAF's concerned they're important points. Well let's get into it. I'm going to go with my favorite bit of it which is radar. That's so... my favorite bit too. <laughs> is it? Oh fantastic. Yeah. In that case maybe we should move it to the end but <laughs> <laughs> but let's, let's 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 get into it because the thing I, I I thought was really interesting in in your book was it's a new technology, it's new to everybody, mm -hmm. and it's one of those things that in all aspects of it, whether it's from uh, the filter rooms through to the the use of it, women are ever present in it. So, did the fact that it was new help women to get assigned to say the radar stations themselves or is it just a general lack of manpower for them it's a general lack of manpower it's i think it's fortuitous in some ways um because it has to be based in britain and that's where the women are, are allowed to serve that's where they're restricted to serve initially um they do go on to serve overseas but in the in the, in the time where radar is critically important in, in the battle of britain they are working at home and radar has to be based at home. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of in that respect, it may be why there were so many of them involved in that work. 
Interestingly, they wouldn't be the first choice purely and simply because they were not educated in maths and science to the point where men were. They did needlework and cooking and useful domestic things at school, and they were not required or in some some cases allowed to take maths and science at school to a very high level. And obviously, I'm sure you know of things about radar. I have had to learn things about radar. It is not uh, very easy if you don't understand the things like physics and maths, because there's a lot of calculations and stuff involved. So it was something where they wouldn't necessarily have been the first group of people that the RAF went, oh, you'll do, um, because you've got the right, you know, training. It was more a case of, oh, you're here, we can train you pretty quickly. And that's what they had to do. And that technology, as you rightly just said, a lot of men had never clapped eyes on before. So it's it's very novel for this group of women to have to use this technology that's so new, it's fresh out of the box. And they have to learn on the job and they have to learn fast. <laughs> so what jobs are they going to be doing in the radar net? Because it's, you know, we're not going to go into all the chain load and home and all those, all those good things, um, or how it works, because that's going to show me up more than oh. anything else. <laughs> <laughs> it's my show, and we don't do that on my show. Yeah. But what what roles were they doing? Because yeah, the, the classic thing from all of those movies at the time is the women with the big headsets pushing the counters around. But they're doing a lot more than that. So what roles are they filling um, in the stations themselves? So the interesting thing here is, you know, most people know about radar and the importance of radar in the second world i would say most people who know things about the battle of britain and the second world war but what what the real secret was and this was from the germans as well happily in the war mm -hmm. the doubting system so radar is the technology and doubting system is this it's the world's first integrated air defense system and it's the system in which this technology is deployed the technology in and of itself would have had WAF sat on cliff tops in radar, coastal radar stations, accumulating information about incoming Luftwaffe raids. If it were not for the downing system, that information would not have gone anywhere and it would not have resulted in anything. So when we say integrated, this integrated air defense system, we're talking about different components of air defense working together very very effectively it's very sophisticated so it starts at those clifftop radio stations radar stations so you've got WAF often in quite precarious positions sometimes even in caravans on the edges of very windy cliffs I was in Dover a few weeks ago and the wind on those cliffs I was thinking goodness that's so dangerous and you've got these 360 foot radar towers which are obviously there um, so the Luftwaffe can see them so, you know, it's a bit of a hairy place to be. And they've got their their radar technology. So that's looking out to sea. And it can pick up. It sends out, loosely speaking, it sends out a beam that is then uh, hits an aircraft and is reflected back. And when it's received by the WAF and radar station, they can basically record certain pieces of information about the raid. And it might be a friendly group of aircraft. It might be ours. And that prevents, you know, friendly fire. It might be an enemy raid, and that is much more serious. So you can tell um, approximate altitude, number of aircraft in the incoming raid, um, heading, bearing, various bits of information that are obviously useful um, in, in intercepting and downing that raid. That information needs to go, ultimately, to a fighter squadron that can be scrambled or an anti-aircraft artillery site that can be activated to deal with this raid. So how does it do it? It's gonna go through this system of processes and there are WAF involved at every point. So first of all, it's gonna go from the coastal radar site to Bentley Priory Fighter Command's headquarters to their filter room. And I was at Bentley Priory a few weeks ago, which is a, a really great museum now actually. And it does a way better job of explaining all of this than I will, so thoroughly recommend. But basically, it goes into the filter room of Bentley Priory. So there's there's some WAF in there. They have to filter this information because it's essentially kind of raw scientific data at this point. So filtering is removing anomalies and it's making the data make sense. It then goes next door to Bentley Priory's operations room. And that is where Air Chief Marshal Sir Hugh Dowding is watching the progress of the battle. 
that information we took you just talked about the, the ladies with the headsets on there's a big map on a central table that covers the uk mm. and the ladies with the headsets on who are stood around the table are doing one of the most stressful jobs that i think anyone had to do in the battle of britain they are plotting which means they're putting little counters on the map to depict information about the incoming raid and through the headset they're listening to the radar site so they're listening to a WAF on a radar site saying this is what is coming then they're doing with their little and they look like casino croupier sticks they're poking counters around the map they're moving them they're they're putting real time intelligence on a map so the RAF brass usually Dowding's in there can see with a delay of you know maybe two to five minutes what is actually happening throughout the Battle of Britain. It's real-time intelligence. It's then going to go from there to a group operations room. So the RAF's kind of ge geographic reach is split into various groups. They've all got operations rooms. And inside of them, there are sectors. They've all got operations rooms. So you eventually you get through the system. And then at every point through this system, you've got WAF and communications. And we must not forget the importance of communications because women form the backbone of communications in the military services and without them no information goes anywhere so this information reaches a sector operations room and they are the point at which you will scramble fighter squadrons or you will activate an anti-aircraft artillery site or you will sound an air raid siren and act on that intelligence so it has to go through this big system and there are WAF involved in basically every part and I think that's just amazing. The the cohesiveness of that is just brilliant. And it is it is decisive, isn't it? That 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 chain of command never broke. Those moments when it went a little bit darker than it should have, but it it was it was there and it was kept running by by the women of the WAF, which is fantastic. Now there is a line in your book which made me very happy when I read it on the plane, which was Robert Watson Watt, the man who invented it invented radar well perfected it for, for use within the doubting system he said there was the anti ham fistedness of women made them ideal for being radar operators i thought that was that, that was a, a wonderful line from someone who knew the precision that was needed to operate his kit and who was best for that job yeah he also said he thought women were quite good at it because they were good darners of socks so make of that what you will <laughs> Um, and there's a lovely word yes. that was used in, in recruitment for plotting, and it was unflappability, which I really like. We're looking for unflappable women. <laughs> <laughs> and they were. And we're going to get more into that now because we're going we're gonna to pivot over from sort of sending ra radio waves out and, and listening in on them, which is the Y service, which has always fascinated me. Because we, we, we hear very much about Bletchley Park. You were there on Saturday, of course, for, for, your, for your launch. But what was the Y service? And really, how does the WAF sort of fit into something? I guess, yeah, we, we think of Bletchley, we think of the Navy and people like that. But how did the WAF fit into this? And how did, uh, how did women in the Secret Service get, get seen, really? The Y service is frustratingly, it's always just below the surface of what we see and hear. I think it's kind of bubbled for a bit. We've had the odd kind of look at it and in some books and some work that's been coming out. Mm. But it's it's been kind of lurking there for a while. And you're absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, Bletchley would have had absolutely nothing to do <laughs> if it wasn't for the Y service. <laughs> we all hear about, you know, famous Alan Turing and Gordon Welchman, some of the other Josh Cooper, some of the co-breakers who were there doing fantastic work and none of this is ever to take away from those individuals, but purely and simply wouldn't have had anything to do if it weren't for the Y service because you can't decrypt or decode information that you don't have. So the Y service has, it's a, essentially a listening service. It's got different sort of sections. So each military service has a section and the civilian intelligence services have sections and their focus is obviously on their counterpart. So the RAF section of the Y service is concerned with Luftwaffe communications. So you've got WAF and members of the RAF posted in what they call Y listening stations around Britain and its territories. 
listening to Luftwaffe communications, radio communications, either air to air, air to ground. Um, sometimes they actually managed to pick up on panzer divisions as well, so they could hear tanks talking to each other. But but it's hard. I mean, I recently had a go on a mock kind of radio set and it was really tough i think the toughest thing for me was the noise the background noise the interference from weather and trying to you know tune and tune and tune until you can actually hear voices or or morse code or a rate sometimes it was plain voice um messages sometimes it was a morse code um but trying to actually pick that out of all the interference and the, and the feedback was actually really tricky so it meant sitting there for hours trying to tune into it a message and then as soon as you get it get it down as quickly as possible and sometimes that meant being able to understand german if it was a voice message so the wire service is very much looking for women who can speak german or understand german you're going to tune in to a frequency write down everything you can hear so you need to understand morse code and possibly german Write it down as quickly as you can in as much detail as you can, because if you miss anything, it literally could cost lives. So that's, you know, all of this work, all I all I keep thinking about is, could I take that kind of pressure? And I really don't think I could. I mean, I guess it goes back to the tea bag, but you don't know, do you, until you're in hot water. But it was, it was tough work and long nights um, in these kind of often quite remote wise stations, desperately trying to tune into messages that you know could be the difference between life and death and for someone who's never listened to a high frequency transmission back in the day we used to have to talk to our aircraft or a long way away on them and it's it's like looking through fog really isn't it it's just yeah. noise that there'll be a voice or something coming over it. It, it is so hard and the thought of listening to that for a whole shift yeah is is terrifying because you must take your headphones off and all you can hear is the sh yeah, no, it drives <laughs> you oh, 100% oh it would be it would be awful but they they did it and they they kept feeding feeding betchley but there's a wonderful bit in your book and I I sort of merged the questions together which was my bad which was the security services themselves that were running betchley running um the Y service we would know them now as MI5 MI6 and and the other ones that popped up during the war. But how did they view, because we, we sort of talked about the, the RAS view of them, the idea that a woman can't keep a secret. That, I guess that for a security service was one that they, to be diplomatic, struggled with to get their heads around. Yes, it was a pretty general idea, actually. Um, everything was so compartmentalized in British intelligence. It had to be for secrecy reasons the more of the picture you can see the more of the picture you can give away so keep it compartmentalized and it ensures a higher level of secrecy and reduces damage if anything does get out and that meant that the services and the sections didn't really have that much to do with each other but there is this consistent idea across most of them and i would say even in public that women were a bit gossipy loose-lipped you can see it in the propaganda, which we do have a look at in the book. We've got the Fugas series, Careless to All Cost Lives, and you've got nattering ladies on buses with German high command sitting behind them listening. And you've got the keep mum, she's not so dumb. <laughs> yes. It's, um, and you've, got, you've got the one in your book of the, the lady in the cocktail dress, isn't it, with the, the yeah. officers standing yes. behind her. And that, yeah. that, that's the one, isn't it? Yeah. It's it's, fa it's fascinating because, you know, I came across some documents about Bletchley and there's there's a, a guy who's down the pub boasting about this secret work he's doing up at the mansion that he's not supposed to talk about, but he is to a group of women. But in that instance, it's the women who are seen as subversive because if women are present in a pub with servicemen, they're luring information. Out. He's volunteering it. You know, and he was sacked <laughs> for it and faced consequences, but it's still their fault because their their subversive presence in the pub made him do it. Um, so it's definitely the, and I, I think it's it obviously stems from you know Marta Hari, the idea of the femme fatale mm -hmm. spy seductress. Marta Hari was was an exotic dancer during the First World War who sort of slept away through the German high command and 
um, was executed for espionage and treason. And it just left this bad taste in the mouth about women in secret work. It just, they're not trustworthy. They cannot be trusted. They should not be trusted. Um, and, and that didn't go away. Obviously, you know, they proved it wrong. The WAF and all the other women who worked in intelligence, not to say there weren't any secrets and breaches because of women, but overwhelmingly, they waited a lot longer than men did to talk um, about their war service. You see a lot more male memoirs pop up before female ones do. And I have personally spoken to veterans, 98-year-old um, lady I interviewed recently, and trying to get anything out of her on operational intelligence was like getting blood out of a stone. <laughs> this is decades after the war. She's been released from her oath, but she said to me, no, I remember signing the, seat, the official seat was acting with a gun on the table next to it, and we were told, you do not talk about this work. And, and they took that so seriously that it made my life very difficult during the course of this research. We're going to take a quick break so that we can get the latest from the Pima Air and Space Museum with Head of Collections, Andrew Bowley. Here we are at the Pima Air and Space Museum uh, among our collection of kamikaze aircraft. Um, we have two versions of the Oka, which was a suicide rocket-powered human-guided bomb. This version here is the two-seat trainer version. We made a couple of them that were uh, launched on a catapult with one rocket engine that they would use to train uh, potential Oka pilots. Um, you have the instructor in the back and the student up front. It technically could glide and they could land it back on the skid and you know learn how to fly the operational version of the aircraft it also had a longer wingspan to allow it to uh, perform as a glider the operational oka right over here um, which is on loan from the royal air force museum um, the trader version is actually on loan from the national air and space museum the operational oka was an anti-shipping human guided suicide bomb it would be loaded underneath a Japanese G4M Betty bomber. Um, it would be launched at four, three rockets in the back, if I recall correctly, and really only had about less than a minute, only maybe about, it was about 20 or 30 seconds worth of uh, actual flight time. And then it would kind of go into a terminal dive uh, on a ship guided by the suicide or kamikaze pilot flying the aircraft. They weren't all that successful, um, not because of the design itself. The biggest problem being the fact that they were strapped on a Japanese Betty. They had to get within about 20 miles of the American fleet, which meant most of them were shot down while still strapped on the Japanese bomber. Um, but they did have a few successes uh, off of Okinawa. So the aircraft behind it is a Nakajima Ki-115 Tsurugi, which is another purpose-built kamikaze aircraft. During the war, the majority of the kamikaze aircraft leading up to you know the end of the war were mostly repurposed aircraft, so Zeros, Oscars, Bettys, Bells, etc. Um, with the Tsurugi, the Japanese Army Air Service was building an aircraft specifically designed from bottom up as a one-way mission kamikaze suicide special attack force aircraft. Um, the wings are made out of aluminum. The fuselage is essentially made out of metal that's no different than you'd have in air ducting. That's why it's kind of rusted. The inside of the cockpit is all very rudimentary with like wooden, made out of wood, wood control stick and throttle, maybe three or four gauges at best. Um, the landing gear actually dropped off the aircraft so that they could repurpose them. Also, you know, it kind of forced, I will say it probably also forced the Japanese pilot onto his to complete his mission or attempt to complete his mission. So once you uh, drop the landing gear, the explosive or bomb that's armed underneath your aircraft, you're not exactly going to be able to belly land that aircraft without uh, destroying yourself in the aircraft. But this was kind of shows just like how desperate the Japanese were getting at the end of the war, just making these mass produced um, kind of like simple built aircraft, um, just so they could have the sheer numbers for them for the uh, what they expected to be the decisive invasion of Japan uh, with the first in Kyushu and then Hanshu 
But because of the dropping of the atomic bombs in Hirohito, realizing that they could not go on any longer, that they decided to surrender to the United States, or and the Allies, I should say. And we're back with Dr. Sarah Louise Miller discussing the women behind the few. You've got a group called the Secret Six, which is just the most wonderful title for a, a, a group of women within intelligence. Who who were who were they? Sort of briefly, we don't want to spoil it too much. Go on, read the book. There's loads about them, but who were the Secret Six? Because I, I I fell a bit in love with them. They were fab. I do like the Secret Six. Yeah, um, basically, so it was a lot of the time during the Second World War, it wasn't kind of an immediate thing to be identified as an intelligence officer. Um, you might be doing intel what was essentially intelligence work, but the Secret Six are the first kind of, you know, really visible in the service anyway, intelligence officers in the WAF. So there, there are six women from the WAF who serve in the Y service obviously as intelligence officers. One of them is one of my personal favorite women in the book, Eileen Clayton. Um, she's fast now, I'll come back to her in a second. Barbara Pemberton was one of the secret six. She was later awarded an MBE for her work with the unit. One of my other favorites, the Honorable Mrs. Jeffrey Pearson was actually fairly deaf. Um, and I don't know if that's like a good thing or a bad thing if you're working in the White House because on, on the upside, the interference and the, the background noise is probably going to bother her less. But on the other, can she hear what's being transmitted? Um, I, she must have done a good job because she was one of the six, but she spoke very good German. So they snapped her up. But Eileen, Eileen is just wonderful. She's actually the first WAF to be commissioned for intelligence duties in July 1940, so Battle of Britain. Um, fairly hairy time to be told you're the first WAF, go do intelligence work. Um, but she did, and she did so very, very well and very interestingly. One of my personal favourite stories about her, though, in a particularly hairy raid during the Battle of Britain, there's a lot of bombing going on. Her superior officer, RAF officer, started to get a bit hysterical. So the RAF had been worried that the WAF, this group of women, were going to get emotional and hysterical. Um, and her, her superior RAF officer got a bit kind of, you know, frazzled and hysterical. So she just made a judgment call. And went up and slapped him right across the face, hard. Um, no one said anything. Uh, they all just returned to work. Apparently it worked. Um, and she worried for days that there'd be repercussions, but there weren't. Um, and I just think that's a, a really good way to solve a situation like that. And I wish I, wish I could do that sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> the work that they did is is remarkable. And it, you know, like I said, they, they kind of get lost behind Turing and... And, yeah. and the others, but what's what's the lasting impact of of the WAFs within the Y service? Because, as you said, they, they taken it so seriously that even now that they're, they're still unwilling to be as free with what they got up to. So, what what's been the impact of them, sort of more broadly? Their impact at the time was massive. Like we've said, you know, Bletchley couldn't function without them, and people at Bletchley have admitted that Asa Briggs in his work is he was he was based at Bletchley Park. He's quite, he said a few times, we just wouldn't have had anything to work on. You know, they were absolutely vitally mm. necessary to what happened at Bletchley and to other forms of intelligence. Because a lot of the time, you know, intelligence is coming in from different directions in the wider picture. And it's it's help, helping, corroborating, disproving all over the place. So the wide service has its fingers in lots of pies. Um, and their impact was was massive. But it was, you know, one of the reasons I called this book The Women Behind the Few is because the women were behind the few in terms of supporting them. You know, like, we're behind you, we've got you. But at the same time, they're behind them in terms of historical memory. Um, and the mm. Wise Service, I think, is a really good example of that because they were behind so many operations, so many instances where intelligence was vitally useful, but never really got the recognition um, that they deserved. And their their work was was so important and it's a real shame to me that they've been kind of omitted and I think that's improving slowly we're starting to look behind closed doors now and I hope that we manage to get more and more stuff out there on them agreed that'll be 
that would be wonderful. Now, our last sort of quick look at, at the WAFs are going to be the ones that I probably know a little bit more about, which is the the ones that were involved with uh, photo interpretation at RF Medmenden. So what was going on there? Because this is much like much like radar, it is completely new to the RAF in the volume that they're going to be operating in. So how did the WAFs get involved with photo interpretation? I suppose, what is photo interpretation for those that, that don't know? But yeah, looking at a photo and understanding what it is, is the basic. But what, what were they doing to, to understand these reams of photos that were coming back from the PRU? Well, when I first read about photo interpretation, I thought, well, uh, that sounds like an, a nice job, actually. You can sit there and have a look at some photos and make some notes. Um, and then I looked at some aerial photos. <laughs> And I was like, okay, I see why the word interpretation has been used here, because it is basically a form of decoding. Um, if you've ever seen an aerial photo, because they're often taken from pretty much a bird's eye view, so straight down or oblique or, you know, slightly angled, it's still really hard to read, um, to tell what you're actually seeing, because they just look like blobs. It's like Lego. Um, and I was at uh, Danesfield House a few weeks ago, which was RAF Medmenham in the Second World War, and they've still got a number of photos, and it, it, it's just shapes. Mm -hmm. So really, photo interpretation is is looking at aerial reconnaissance photos that have been taken from thousands of feet in the air, and trying to make head or tail of what you're actually looking at. Um, it, you know, with most of these forms of intelligence, it's quite obvious why this information is useful. Photo interpretation is very useful because you've got first-hand information on the enemy's intentions and capabilities. If you see a build-up of troops or tanks, it's fairly, you know, indicative that their intention is to invade or push into somewhere. Or, you know, if if there is a lot of activity in a, a built up area that there wasn't before maybe they're working on a new kind of technology it's just deducing information from what you're physically seeing on pictures and that meant flying thousands of sorties um or flights aerial reconnaissance flights with special cameras attached to the bottom of modified aircraft which the pilots hated because the film was very flammable so put them in a lot more danger those planes come back after their reconnaissance sorties and it's often WAF who are taking that film off the plane and they take it off and uh, develop it and that's actually some of them got poisoned through the chemicals in that involved in that process then their photos had to be kind of sent to the right people so you, you'd end up building up expertise so you might have someone who had particular expertise in looking at airfields or looking at aircraft um, or ships, it, you know, it, whatever someone, if you spend hours and hours and hours looking at the same thing, you do begin to build up kind of a specialism or expertise in it. So the, the pictures had to go to a, to a section that was best placed to deal with them. So for instance, you have the airfield section, um, and then it's a case of pouring over them. And we're talking millions of prints by the end of the war, an archive of millions and millions of pictures to look at anything that might be useful and that often meant looking at them 24 hours apart so you could have pictures taken one night and then the next and then the next and, and what's changed um because that's what's going to give you an, in, an an indication of what the enemy intends so we want a picture of you know equipment or troop movement you can see what they're capable of but often intentions you have to guess more at um and, and often that was an educated guess based on what these pictures said and WAF photo interpreters were given kind of a, a shopping list of things they needed to be, um, which would have a good visual memory, um, mm. be able to sketch a lot of the time. Attention to detail. I have rubbish attention to detail. This is why I failed so many driving tests because I don't see details, uh, but they had to see every detail. Um, an inquiring mind, don't just look at something, look at it and go, why is that there? What does that mean? What has changed? And be, you know, constantly asking questions. Uh, curious, I love this phrase, curious in the unusual. So don't look at something and go, oh, that's weird. Next picture. Look at something and go, oh, that's weird. What does it mean? What could it be? 
And again, they haven't studied maths and sciences. So it's, it's fascinating the number of them that managed to come up with ways of doing things on the job and then even write manuals that they leave for the people coming up behind them for the next WAF who were shoved into the job. Mm. Oh, yeah, we found this quite hard because we didn't have any of the requisite training. But here, this is how we figured out how to do it. This might help you. Um, so they're not only rising to the occasion and doing this job, they're making it easier for people to do this job around them which I think is just amazing. Because there's a fantastic story of Constance Babington Smith, isn't it? Who, who yeah. sort of pours over Jane's, pours over everything, writes writes the documentation and ends up in charge of the aircraft interpretation section. And famously, it was, it was her that spotted the V1, wasn't it? it? Yeah, it's that's exactly what we're talking about because she saw an object on a photo and, and it didn't make sense. And she said, what is that? And lots of people had looked at it and, you know, had a guess. Um, and she just couldn't let it lie. It was a team effort. And we must always remember that with intelligence because we have this tendency to kind of isolate individuals like Alan Turing. And they get like, you know, a, a certain amount of adulation, which is never, it's never to say that they don't deserve the admiration that we give them. They do. But it's, it's important to remember there are often teams involved. And with Constance Babington Smith, she had her team. But ultimately, the thing I think is really interesting about her is that she was told to let it go where the V weapons were concerned because she took those the, the kind of ideas to superiors and they said, oh, it's lake dredging equipment based on where it is. Um, and she, she just wasn't satisfied with that. And she said, no, I don't think it is. And carried on looking at it, comparing it. And comparing it was really useful because she could see, you know, what changed over time and ultimately determined that it was a pilotless aircraft on a launch ramp pointing toward London. So thank goodness she didn't just chalk it up as, you know, lake dredging equipment. She persisted. And I think that might have been quite hard because she she was a woman in a sort of male dominated um, area. And she was a section head, but there weren't many WAF section heads without an RAF officer equivalent or superior rank. So she was kind of standout in that way. And a, co a colleague of hers was very complimentary and said, Babs has sufficient strength of character, an extraordinary singleness of purpose, together with total dedication to the task, mixed in with a modicum of determination necessary to be able to assume sole command a modicum of determination i hope someone says that about me <laughs> <laughs> for anyone who hasn't read it her her, her book on her experiences is, is is a must read for, for yeah. every, everyone it, it, it's it's fantastic Evidence in what, mm, and what i thought was interesting is is how you sort of contrasted that with stella palmer's experience of she was looking at the the raid photography, seeing how effective Bomber Command were being. And she was writing reports, highlighting the trouble that Bomber Command was having, finding and hitting their targets. What advice was she given? Stella Palmer felt um, that she was, she's kind of, it's kind of a don't shoot the messenger type situation. So this is a problem all over intelligence all through time if a commander or a leader says we need this or we want this by way of intelligence they're not happy with anything but that and the RAF wants to hear we hit our targets you know we accomplish things because I mean particularly with bomb command it's such a high level of loss and sacrifice and there's almost this need that it needs to be for something um, which is understandable. These these guys need to be able to write home to mothers and fathers and say your son died for a good reason. But and, and I think that weighed very heavily on Stella and her colleagues because they felt that they were being required to give information that at the end of the day sometimes just wasn't true. So if they gave accurate statistics after a raid, um, they would be kind of accused of minimising the effects of what Bomber Command were doing. And they were often put under quite a lot of pressure from station commanders to publish reports that weren't necessarily true, um, saying that there had been glorious success. That was all worth it when actually that wasn't true. So I, yeah, 
it's understandable, but it's also, it puts them in a really tricky position. I don't know how I'd have dealt with that. <laughs> and, you know, that they persisted with not, I guess we'd call it sexing up a report these days, wouldn't, wouldn't we? Yeah, that, that they didn't, you know, with the, the butt report that came later that, that fed into the changes that made Bomber Command so devastating later. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's a testament to them not bowing to the pressure and, and in Stella's example, especially. I wasn't sure if I was going to mention this, but we just need to give a quick, shh. no, we're not. We're not going to say, ladies and gentlemen, when you get the book and you must, because it's fab, wait till you get to Edna Skeens and Faye Gillen, because their story with 146, this show's called The Damn Casters. So we need to just get people to go look at the 617 Squadron story. It wasn't all Guy Gibson. He needed some help to make sure he could get to where he was going. So go check that book out, that book, that bit out. It's fabulous. We're not going to because we want people to buy the book. And well, it's a good Easter egg. It really is. Yes. So let's let's start the last few questions I have for you, really, because this is sort of the, the impact questions. So you've been living this for a while now. Yeah, a while, too. <laughs> what's what's your impression of the legacy of the women's auxiliary air force and yeah i guess it's safe to say we have underestimated them but do you think we've really underestimated them and maybe not given them the due that they deserve i think yes absolutely i've come to understand why i think if intelligence work and i teach on intelligence and national security modules and something i'm always saying is we only ever hear about intelligence when it's gone wrong. Mm. We hear about 9-11, um, the intelli massive intelligence failures, you know, that are behind disasters like that um, and atrocities. We hear about it when there's a failure. If we hear about it, something has gone wrong. So with, with intelligence, it's not unusual to not know and I think it's testament actually to how well they did their jobs that we don't know about it. It's testament to how well they did their jobs to keep it in the shadows, but it's also testament to how good they were at keeping secrets because they didn't come out and write tons and tons of books about it and, and go, oh, I need to get my face all over the place as the hero of World War II. Not that anyone did, but they certainly did not do that. And I think- Fle Fleming, Fleming tried. I, don't get me started on them. <laughs> it's um it's sad but it is understandable you also had issues like and one thing i'm desperately trying to correct through all of my work right now is what i think has been a massive misunderstanding sometimes even mythology around what women did so you have this idea that because they were sat at desks um they were doing clerical work because that's all women did you have the idea that because their title might have been clerk special duties, it's got the word clerk in it. So naturally they were, you know, typing when actually they were in the Y service. Um, and I think that it, again is inevitable, but it's unfortunate. So I'm on a bit of a kind of bandwagon, I suppose, at the moment, trying to disrupt that idea and, and dissect what they actually did, deconstruct existing ideas and, and reconstruct their history situated in wider war history. Because I think we have this tendency to view women's war history as peripheral and separate. It's in the, it's in the title, auxiliary, supplementary. Mm. When actually, if you look at something like the Battle of Britain, and, and I, I believe personally, you know, wider instances in the war, they are not peripheral. They are mainstream. So for me, a, a big kind of mission with this book was mainstreaming the history of these women. It's not women's history. It's, it's history. It's war history. Um, and I think that while we view it as separate, it's not getting the kind of message across of the truth of what they actually did or what it meant. So I do feel quite, if, in case you haven't noticed, I do feel quite strongly about it. Um, and I plan yeah, to continue that, hanging that. That has... <laughs> Yeah, that it has come across. Yeah, and I guess that's perfect for my for my last question. Really, is the impact that this has had? Because clearly, you're this isn't you. You've done the book. You've you've moved on. This is this is certainly something you continue working. But what has been the impact of your research so far been on you? I you know your your passion for this has been 
has been clear to see and it's been lovely to chat to you about it um but what's what's that sort of lasting impact on you when you think back to where you were when you started on on this bit of research it's it's funny because it started out as a bet for 20 quid and it has i mean i know it sounds corny but it has changed my life um and everything that i do now in my career is about this kind of passionate pursuit of of giving women the recognition that they deserve in history and resituating their contributions um truthfully in inside the history of the second world war uh, and and history in general and i think you know there's there's been days when i've come away from archives and i haven't been able to stop crying and there have been days where i frightened my cat because i was giggling so hard at something a waff wrote in a diary i've been on a journey um and i thoroughly recommend reading service women's diaries and, and memoirs because they are just some of the most wonderful reading you will ever do um and you can't forget that and i think in my everyday you know i've learned so much from reading their stories and i i want to say that it has changed a lot for me and i never want to stop doing this it's definitely my kind of life calling now i would say <laughs> that's wonderful thank you now just before I do the real thank yous and we, we say goodbye to our dear listener. There's one more thing you have coming up. So if you're listening to this on the day of release, which will be on the day the book's out, which is the, the, the 9th of March, on the Saturday, you have a bit of an event going on, don't you? Yes, we are launching the book at the one and only Bletchley Park. I am immensely privileged and grateful it's just like Christmas to be able to launch this book in a place where um, I met, I recently met um, the Bletchley Park, ex Bletchley Park historian who said, when you walk around Bletchley Park, it's like there's the ghosts of 10,000 people walking around with you. And he's absolutely right. If you've never been, definitely go. It's awesome. Um, but to be able to launch the book there this coming Saturday, Saturday the 11th is an immense privilege. Um and we'll be in the ballroom in the mansion at Bletchley. And I have been given a slot to talk about it. And they're going to have a hard time stopping me, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's going to be fantastic. So we'll put all the details into the, into the description as well. And we'll, we'll try to pack the, pack the room out for you. Sarah, this has been a delight. I thoroughly enjoyed the book and thank you so much for, for getting it over to me early so I could have a little sneaky pink. And thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful to chat to someone who's so interested. Interested, maybe not so interesting, but there we go. I'll leave that to other people to decide. Thank you. I cannot thank Sarah enough for joining me here on the Damcasters. It's been a fantastic chat. And as I have said repeatedly through the podcast, and even before the podcast, the book is absolutely fantastic. The book is released on the 9th of March, which is the same day that this podcast drops. And if you're listening to this right away, you might be able to get yourself a ticket for the Bletchley Park launch on the 11th of March, which is this Saturday, if you're listening to this before Saturday. So if you can get down there, I'm sure it's going to be a packed house because the buzz on this book has been fantastic. Sarah's going to be appearing on lots of podcasts and shows, so do check out those other ones as well, including my old friends over at History Hack. So be sure to catch her show with Beth and Alex, which I'm sure will be a riot. As always, I cannot thank everybody enough for their support of the podcast. It has been fantastic. And of course, I have to thank our main sponsor, who is the Pima Air and Space Museum. And we will have more from them at the beginning of each month coming forward with some of the content that I recorded while I was out in Arizona. So please do check out their website, which is listed in the description below, which is quite simple, it's pimaair.org. But be sure to also pick up a copy of Sarah's book, which is on the Boney and Broad Pods bookshop. Link in the description below. If you're in the UK, a little bit of each sale goes to supporting the podcast and of course supporting Sarah and her continued work, which we're really excited for too. If you like this, there's a Patreon, three pounds a month plus VAT, but I know times are tough. The best way to do, just leave a review for the pod, tell us whether you like it or not, and what we need to improve. Um, well, what I need to improve, as I'm the person who kind of does it all. But regardless of that, thank you ever so much for listening. Pick up a copy of Sarah's book. 
it is wonderful. You will not regret it. And I look forward to having her back in the future for whatever she does next. Thanks so much. And as always, do take care of yourselves. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone, and it is a Boney Abroad's podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.